Do you like books? I mean, really, really like books? Then you're in the right place. Each week, your host, Sam Hankin, interviews the best of today's top-selling authors and the up-and-coming superstars of modern literature. This is The Avid Reader. Here is your host, Sam Hankin. Hi, everybody. Welcome to another edition of The Avid Reader, brought to you by Wellington Square Bookshop. Our guests today are Alan Chodos and James Riordan, author of Ghost Particle, In Search of the Elusive and the Mysterious Neutrino. Published by the MIT Press, it was released earlier this year. Alan is the research professor of physics uh, at UTA, and his life has been devoted to research in physics. He was the former director of the Yale Center for Theoretic Physics. The neutrino is his grail, at least it seems so to me. So ghost particle and grail kind of seem to go together in this lopsided metaphor. James is a science journalist who covers physics, math, astronomy, chemistry, and his articles have appeared in Science News, Quanta, uh, Scientific American, New Scientist, and the Washington Post, amongst others. You know, so like David Foster Wallace at his commencement address at Kenyon, he told this story, he goes, you know, there's two of these, these two young fish and they're swimming along in the water. And then this older fish like me swims alongside and he goes, hey boys, how's the water? And the two fish, and then he swims away. And the two fish swim on like, and then one turns to the other and he goes, what the hell is water? And <laughs> I kind of feel like this about the neutrino. I mean, they surround us infinitely. They interact hardly, hardly at all. And I mean, hardly at all, since they can pass unseen through a light year of lead. And at any given second, multiple trillions are passing through us from the sun, from the big bang. And we never know. And if one ever interacts with any tiny, tiny part of us, nothing happens. And we wouldn't know about it if it did. But then there's these vast tanks of water and cleaning fluid deep underground, and they scintillate, they sparkle. If any one of these guys, these poltergeists, these ghosts give off a little spark, and then you can see that for a little bit, and you see a path, and then you find out what flavor it is, you know, or whether it's inside out, and then you're able to go a little further toward an understanding if indeed it is an understanding at all. So as a lay reader, you may ask, so what's the point? Why do we care? Are these scientists like just pulling our legs? But it could be that without these fellows, the universe would just be a Gobi desert without the desert. Because by my watch, in the first trillionth of a second after the Big Bang, if they hadn't destroyed all of antimatter and left a little tiny, tiny, tiny bit of matter left, our, uh, our cosmos wouldn't have formed, our galaxies wouldn't have formed, our us wouldn't even be here. But for them and us being tweaked by billions of variables into existence. So here to explain my rather sophomoric uh, introduction are Alan and James. Welcome, guys. Thank you. It's nice to be here. So to start, I guess, with the little neutral one, who coined this phrase and the particle and the name and on whose giants uh, do, on whose giants' shoulders? Do you guys stand? Um, well, the uh, the answer to your question about who coined the name and who made the first suggestion that it existed are two different people. So, uh, the 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 guy who the giant, in fact, he was a giant who um, first suggested that it, neutrinos ought to exist was a man named Wolfgang Pauli, a uh, Viennese Swiss physicist who uh, in 1930 uh, solved the big problem that existed at that time about the beta decay, the, a certain decay of radio, a radioactive decay that seemed not to conserve energy. And people were aghast that energy seemed not to be conserved. And Pauli came up with the idea that maybe there was another little particle that was being emitted at the same time and that, that the extra energy that, was, that seemed to be missing was being carried off by this new, new but it had to be very, very uh, discreet. You couldn't see it. Otherwise, people would have already noticed it in their experiments. And uh, so Pauli was the one who made that suggestion. It was not immediately adopted because in those days, the only elementary particles that were known were like the proton and the electron and maybe the photon. So adding another particle seemed like, um, you know, you, you really shouldn't do things like that. Um, it, it, 
you're messing everything up if you just start adding particles. Uh, nowadays, it's completely different. We have, we have a zoo of many, many particles that we have to contend with, and adding one more particle is like nothing. But in those days, it was a big deal. And so maybe I can let James talk about who actually gave the neutrino its name, and he can take the story from that from that point. I, I actually can't remember who who came up with the name. Who was it, Alan? Fermi. <laughs> Fermi yeah. called it the ghost particle the first time. Well, Fermi, no, who called it the neutrino? That's what I'm. Okay. I, I, yeah, you said the neutrino. Uh, Pauli, Pauli called it the neutron, but what happened was there was another particle that we all know as neutrons that is a much heavier object that is has nothing to do with the neutrino, and Fermi in his uh, after Pauli's suggestion, Fermi, Enrico Fermi, a great, another giant, a great Italian physicist, um, uh, made a study of, of how Pauli's neutrino would, would interact with other particles. And, um, and he called it the neutrino, which just means the little neutral one in Italian. And as far as ghost particle, I think, I don't think you can trace that back to any uh giant uh or or even not so giant person i mean that that's just a common uh phrase that 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 is comes to mind when you think of a particle that that doesn't it's there all the time but you can't see it and uh um very ghostly and it um so um so Pauli suggested it but the the really hard part was finding it i mean as you said in your introduction uh, you can't, you know, they, they hardly ever interact. Billions go through you every second and you don't feel them. So uh, the, the physics is an experimental science. So you, you, the, the suggestion by Pauli that this thing was there was only a suggestion. It was a, a theoretical idea, but phys it isn't physics until you actually see it in an experiment. And uh, Maybe now I can pass the buck to James if he wants to talk about uh, the experiment because he actually has a personal connection to it, which uh, he might want to talk about also. I don't know. Cool. Well, I do want to say by the time they detect detected the neutrino, uh, the project was called Poltergeist, the Poltergeist Project. Uh, I, and I think that's because it was generally considered a ghostly particle. I don't know that anyone uh, has credit for calling it the ghost particle. But it seemed to have really sort of taken off from uh, from that point forward. People have referred to it generally as the ghost particle, and they did call it poltergeist particle as sort of as a, as a nod to the fact that it is indeed uh, ghostly. I told and you guys. Were I don't, do you want to talk about who discovered the neutrino? Oh, oh yeah. I mean, I, I don't know if you want to ask any questions or we just plow along. No, oh, no, no. I'd I'd rather you go along because I'm going to go off topic, and then you guys are going to be unhappy because we're trying to suck <laughs> the book. Uh, well, uh, Alan is mentioning the fact that one reason that I was interested in in this particle and writing this book uh, was because I was working in Los Alamos, but also because my grandfather is one of the two people. Uh, his Clyde Cowan. He's one of the two people that detected the neutrino in the first place. Oh. So it's always been sort of a, a family history for me. You know, here's the off topic thing. When you guys come up with, you know, like when, when Murray Gell-Mann comes up with quarks because, you know, he had just happened to be leafing through Finnegan's Wake and then changes the pronunciation because, you know, he thinks they're at the bar ordering a pint. But then you, you guys come up with, you know, like charmed and strange and ghost particle and, and you know, uh, colors and flavors and poltergeist. People like think or spin, you know, half spin, you know. What are lay people supposed to think? You're telling us because we're dumb. And it's the only words you can use because we don't know math, but they all sound strange. And if you type ghost particle into Google, you come up with thousands and thousands of results that say ghost particle neutrino, ghost particle neutrino. And I'm thinking, why is it really called a ghost? Just because it can pass through things? It's not scary. Well, maybe it is, but yeah. So. This is the off topic thing. And then we'll go to the book and the cover and the uh, ep excellent epigraphs. But why do you use these metaphors? Simply to help us get an idea of what's going on? Uh, Sounds like an alien question. <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, the ghost particle is a metaphor that um, 
if I could be more crass, maybe it's being used to try to sell books. I, I don't know, rather than anything else. <laughs> but um, well, you have a good time. The other ones, the, the other ones that you mentioned, like flavor and charm and beauty and strangeness, and those are actually used day to day by physicists. Those are not. Those are not invented to explain to the lay public what's going on. Those are words that physicists. So when when we say the neutrino changes its flavor, uh, we're not talking only to. Uh, I mean, it's a, it's. In fact, I would say the opposite. I mean, fla probably if you use that metaphor to uh, the uh, the lay public, they get confused because they think, well, do these? You know, do, can I taste them? Can I actually taste neutrinos? What flavor are they? I mean, but physicists use those terms, and it's and I think Murray Gell-Mann, whom you mentioned, um, has a lot. Uh, I mean, if you want to blame somebody, he's he's the chief culprit in this. He he loved giving uh, crazy names to, but the ideas are serious. I mean, you have to remember that even though um, the names sound funny and and maybe. Uh, you know the the opposite spectrum is maybe organic chemistry where everything has a name that's about 40 syllables long and 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 uh, and unpronounceable so on on our side we like to use words that are um common and maybe evocative and uh and everybody can remember them and they, when you use those words they know what you're talking about uh but they are actually other uh, most of them are are we're not making them up just for the purpose of uh, popularization. Yeah, well, and even ghost particle, you know, it, it stems from poltergeist particle, but it it wasn't an effort to sell it to the general public. It's that when Pauli proposed it, he was a little embarrassed that he proposed something that he thought would never be detected. He was a little sheepish about that. And so I, th I think ghost particle is less a, a, a public relations gimmick than it is uh, initially an expression of the of the frustration that came when they said this solves the problems but you're not never going to see it and that made you know certainly niels bohr was so upset at that that he refused to accept it even though a lot of, a lot of people in the community had decided this has to be the answer it's funny whenever you see murray gellman gellman describing this he's just like Feynman. he's laughing they're both so enthusiastic about what they do and you probably are too alan it's just like isn't it a pleasure to watch them? Because they're just like, they love what they're doing and they also think it's funny somehow. And it just, it translates so well, doesn't it? Well, you know, physics, most physicists would say physics, physics is fun to do. And uh, it's not always fun. I mean, there's a lot of hard work that goes into it too. But uh, I mean, in, in, in fact, in the book, there there's, uh, when we describe the experiment of, Detect the neutrino by uh, James's grandfather Cowan and his collaborator uh, Rhinus. Uh, after they had done that, they were still working at Los Alamos, and the director of the at Los Alamos said, "Okay, you boys have had enough fun. Get back to work on nuclear weapons." I mean, that was you know, you know so it, the idea was that what they were doing, detecting the neutrino, was just having fun, and 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 there's a lot of evidence that. Uh, James has unearthed from his personal files that they indeed were having fun. They there were a lot of little jokes that they inserted into the um, the way they planned the experiment and things like that. So um, you know it was serious work, but it was something they really enjoyed doing. Obviously, yeah, it's funny that like your grandfather is like half these guys who were creating this incredibly destructive. Thing that now is in the movie Oppenheimer for people to see. They were also doing this. They were also neutrino guys. And like, talk a little bit, uh, James, about El Monstro, which is what Alan's talking about too, because here they are doing all this stuff to get a bomb. At the same time, they say, hey, you know what? This bomb is a great opportunity to do something else. Yeah, that was astounding. I mean, and certainly the... Uh... The fact was that the, at the time, and even now, the, the, the most intense source of neutrinos you could possibly have is with a nuclear weapon. And, you know, these guys were both on site to help make sure the, that the bombs worked and were extremely uh, lethal. 
that was one of the things that Rhinus was doing was calculating how high you should detonate the bomb so that you do the most destruction. And uh, and Cowan was uh, putting out detectors to try to understand how efficient these bombs were uh, when they went off in tests to ensure that you got as much energy and therefore destruction out of them as possible. And that was one of the reasons that Rhinus decided to study the, the neutrino was he sort of had enough of that and wanted to do something that was uh, certainly purer science. I don't know that he had ethical issues with the bomb, but he was he was ready to do something besides these these uh, kind of gruesome calculations. So you know the design for their experiment, El Monstro, was was pretty audacious. They were they it had to re required some very fine uh, timing. It it required having something close to a bomb, which just in in itself is an amazing uh, 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 at least aspiration. They had dug the hole. They had paid for the hole. They were all ready to do it when they realized that they could they could do it next to a nuclear reactor and not have quite as much uh, uh, drama going on when they did their measurement. Um, so they ended up canceling at the very last, uh, the last moment. You know, I was thinking about my introduction, and I was thinking, here's another tortured metaphor, and and why you know someone who's you know my bookstore people come in and whether you like it or not, they do judge a book by its cover, and your cover is really cool. We can talk about it because it tells a lot. But suppose like there's this hermit who's immortal, and he lives up in this mountain in a cave and he's just up there thinking and suppose out of one of these eons these millions of years there's a, a backpacker and he walks up the mountain and right out of the corner of his eye he just sees that guy but he doesn't think about it because he barely sees him like you know comfortably numb by pink floyd and then he just walks by so what do we care he didn't interact with him he barely saw him and the guy never interacted with him. So as I'm reading your book, I go, well, we're in this infinite, as you say, this infinite sea of these guys, but they don't do anything as far as we're concerned, other than what I said about creating the universe. But other than creating the universe, they don't do it. <laughs> Well, and and you know, if you don't mind me stepping back a little bit, there was a time when people didn't know how the sun worked, and uh, and and um, Lord Kelvin proposed that it was just that a bunch of material had come together and and mashed up and got and the gravity had made it so hot that the sun was going to glow for about I don't know I think he estimated thirty or forty thousand years, and then it was going to die and life would go away. <clears throat> when they discovered uh, fusion, radiation, and fusion. Uh, and fission and fusion, they started to realize, oh, there are, there are other ways to power the sun that may allow for things like evolution. There was a huge conflict between Darwin and Kelvin and these other people that thought that the sun had a very brief lifetime. And Darwin, who said, no, it takes hundreds of thousands of years for small changes to happen. How can those be compatible? So when they discovered that it was, uh, realized that it was fusion, that solved this problem, but not quite. Without the neutrino, we don't understand how fusion works. The neutrino is crucial for uh, nuclear reactions. And if we don't know about the neutrino, we don't know about how the sun works. And, it, you know, these are fundamental, important things about our existence. We don't know how long the sun is going to live if we don't understand fusion. And neutrino was an important part of that, that, that Pauli proposed, even though he said at the same time, you're never going to see it, but it must exist. Well, and, and, go ahead. Uh, yeah. Uh, one, one additional element on what James was saying about how the sun works um, it's interesting that the light that comes from the sun actually was produced, the energy for the light that comes from the sun that we're looking at now was actually produced roughly 100,000 years ago. It takes that long for the energy to work its way. It's produced in the core of the sun. That's where the fusion takes place. And then it works its way out gradually through the other air, uh, parts of the sun to the surface and then to us. So it takes 100,000 years. On the other hand, the neutrinos, the neutrinos that are produced in those same reactions get out right away because like, being neutrinos, they don't see the rest of the sun. They just come straight out. So you can compare the sun of 100,000 years ago with the sun of today by, met, by looking at first at the light and then at the neutrinos. And you can tell whether you know, is the sun dying? Is the sun heating up? Is the sun stable? 
uh, by comparing what you see in photons and what you see in neutrinos. So that's another way in which neutrinos, um, you know, are useful if you want to, if you if you really want to uh, get your money's worth from neutrinos, that's another way that you can uh, use them to get some important information. Yeah, I tell people that if the sun ever died, uh, you wouldn't know about it for many, many generations, but neutrino physicists would be freaking out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. That reminds me of something. If you're a dilettante like me, and you and this, well, the good thing about this book is it it starts making you thinking outside of the box of the book. And you know, I'm still thinking about it now after reading it last week. So, like, I was thinking, you know, how Einstein said that uh, the cosmological constant was the biggest mistake of his biggest blunder of his life, and it's not because of dark energy and dark matter. And then I was thinking, okay, well, these neutrinos are everywhere. And then I was thinking of the ether that everyone used to believe in. It's almost like it's the ether because it's everywhere. So maybe it's the extra mass and energy of the universe that allows the universe to continue to expand. I mean, you're talking about the very, very tiny, and then I'm thinking about the very, very large. Why is that not a possibility since I don't know what I'm talking about? Uh, it is a possibility, but it's a possibility that has been kind of uh, ruled out by. Um, by uh, e experiment and observation. Neutrinos are have this, as you mentioned before, have this tiny, tiny mass, uh, and they just don't have enough mass to be the dark matter that we that's out there that we, we know is out there, but we don't know what it is. And if neutrinos were heavier, they might, um, they might be the right candidates to be dark matter, but they're, they're just, so they're, they contribute a, a tiny amount I mean, they're, you're partially right, but maybe at the level of 5% or something like that. There's still a lot out there that is not neutrinos that we don't know about uh, and would call dark matter. Um, and, but neutrinos are not the, not the total answer to that question. So James, do neutrinos just bypass gravity? Do they just say, you know, I don't really, I'm not really interested in dealing with you right now. Well, everything obeys gravity, even light. So, and light has no mass. But uh, you know, gravity uh, we know now, and Alan knows a lot more about this than I do. But gravity is the warping of space, and neutrinos have to follow uh, have to follow the same sort of rules with gravity as as everything else does. Um, let's see, I've forgotten now. What? Where were you going with this question? <laughs> well, I was going two places. Well, one, you know, I thought you were being wishy washy, which you weren't. I thought first. Do they have no mass at all? Do they have this tiny, tiny bit of mass at all? Is it designed that they have mass? You know, I asked uh, this, uh, I forgot his name, Turchik, I think. He's a Nobel laureate who invented, who discovered time crystals. And I said to him, because I always ever ask everyone this. Frank, Frank Wilczek. Yeah, Wilczek. Frank Wilczek. He knew Feynman really well, too. Um, so I always ask, I asked him, hey, why isn't one a prime number? And everyone else kind of tippy toes around it. And he goes, because it wouldn't be convenient. <laughs> just like Asimov said, hey, we invented these neutrinos just to fill things in. So I still don't know what question <laughs> I'm asking. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, let's see. Um, I, I mean, I think that one thing, that, and I don't know why, if this came from your question or just something I wanted to mention, and that is that the other thing about the neutrinos, and I, we talked about this a little bit in the book, and that is that, uh, at this point, we can't look back to the very beginning of time. The farthest we can look back is to about 300,000 years, maybe 400,000 years after the Big Bang. And before that, you can't see anything because it's just this sort of fog of, of highly charged uh, uh, particles and things. Neutrinos, just like neutrinos, as Alan mentioned, can tell you what's going on with the sun right now. Neutrinos can potentially provide us an image of what the very beginning of the universe looked like because they came out through this fog of materials. Gravitational waves could tell us a little bit about the beginning. I like to think of that as listening to the Big Bang, but potentially when and if we can just uh, ultimately detect these these relic neutrinos, that's the only way we can see what happened before uh, before everything started to clear about four hundred thousand years after the Big Bang. So they provide you know information about the the beginnings as well as the existence of the universe. All right, well, let's go back to the cover. Hey, do either of you guys have a 
a copy of the book because I have the galley which has a copy of the cover because you should uh, show it because that's what really sells the book. Yeah, okay. So that, that's the ghost particle. And it doesn't do anything. It doesn't interact. There's billions of them, trillions of them going through us. Why does that cover make it look so busy? <laughs> like it's doing a lot of stuff. Uh, well, I, I mean, I would say that it is doing a lot of stuff. It's just uh, we we don't have the tools to to see it so much. And, you know, you have to – they are point particles. They have no dimension at all. All, all fundamental particles, elementary particles, are are really just dots, and, and it's, it's hard to depict. So – uh, the, this is more the graphic artists, I guess, looking at the book and trying to get a feel for what it might look like if you were staring at a flood of neutrinos coming at you and you could somehow see neutrinos. So these are individual neutrinos, not interacting with each other, but just showing that they there's a lot of them. And I mean, it's a great cover and it's kind of, I mean, I'd buy this book just from looking at the cover and the title. Yeah, so. I think their interpretation is, let's imagine that they have some dimension and you're staring at this flood of hundreds of trillions of neutrinos flying through you every second what what could that look like and uh, and they also asked us what color we liked and i said purple so they they went with basically a purple palette the other thing is that's really cool about the book and as a bookseller i think i think buyers too sometimes there's an epigraph at the beginning of the book but you picked out these really cool epigraphs for each chapter. And I think that's really cool because if you're just leafing through the book, you look at the epigraph and it's like the outside of a box, a jigsaw puzzle box. You see somebody said something and you go, oh, that's what's going to be inside this chapter. And the first one you did was my favorite, one of my favorite authors, John Updike, which I wrote, John Updike, you know, why are they including a poem by John Updike? And uh, yeah, so that intrigued me. It's the first one too. So who came up with the epigraphs? Did you like divide them up or did they come into your head or did you search or that's that's a hard one. I think that's I came James. up with most of them. Alan might have might have done a, a couple. I, I think they're almost all yours, James. But I, I certainly think that the Updike one is is kind of obvious in that he, you know, he's an amazing writer, amazing, and he he wrote this poem about the neutrino very shortly after it was discovered. And his his poem is fairly accurate for what we knew at the time. He has a scientifically accurate, fun poem <laughs> about the neutrino. How audacious, how incredible is that? <laughs> yeah. And it really, it, it sums up, it sums up the, 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 the whole book in a, in a kind of little, little like, like, uh, like Gelman says, like in a portmanteau almost kind of way. Tells you exactly what it is. It's tiny, doesn't bother anybody. And yeah, it doesn't have an, it's not, doesn't weigh anything. Well, it's, it's, so yeah, the epigraphs were really good. I always think it's cool because it seems to me like the author must really think about it because it's important. And like I said, I think it really intrigues the, the buyer as well. Yeah, so, I, those are a lot of fun. I really enjoyed doing those. What was I going to ask you? Um, well, we talked about how we catch the pesky guys and we talked, you mentioned uh, beta decay, but yeah, you know, I know what. We just kind of like very briefly talked about matter and antimatter i think everyone who reads these kinds of science books designed to be understood by people like me is always fascinated by the fact that something like a little tiny bit is everything so explain that um well i i, I don't know if i would put it quite in those terms but the the um a, a, in the very early universe if there was an equal amount of matter and antimatter, there'd be a lot of it, of course, but but over the course of the evolution, they would, each little antimatter particle would annihilate with a matter particle, and we would end up with uh, no matter left over to make up what we see around us, including ourselves. And um, so there has to be some asymmetry in the laws of physics that allow for more matter to be produced than antimatter. So it's really a question of, now you ask, well, where in the laws of physics could that asymmetry appear? And uh, the currently favored place is uh, in the interactions that neutrinos have, uh, the, the way neutrinos are put together, uh, automatically is it has an asymmetry between matter and antimatter that allows for uh, 
when when the Big Bang had cooled, matter to survive and anti all the antimatter to it's only about I think one part in ten billion or something like that is the is the asymmetry. It's not it's tiny, but so most of it annihilated and and into photons, and, but but that little bit that's left over is everything that we see. And neutrinos are kind of, at least if current theories are correct, neutrinos played a big role in that because their interactions are the ones, the in, interactions involving neutrinos are the ones that allowed for this matter, antimatter asymmetry to evolve. Um, so in that sense, the, I mean, the neutrinos uh, played a tremendous role in, in allowing for the universe as we see it. Um, uh, I mean, the other the other thing I, I'm I'm changing the subject just a slight bit here, but uh, I mean, the other fascinating thing about neutrinos, at least to physicists, is this whole phenomenon of neutrino oscillation, which uh, uh, we spend a fair amount of time talking about in the book. The fact that there are these three flavors of neutrinos, and uh, and if you make a neutrino of one flavor and let it propagate along, it will morph into uh, other flavors as it goes along. So that when you detect it, it might not be the same flavor as what as what you when as it was when you produced it. And that uh, that's in fact the way that we know neutrinos have mass because, as you said, their the mass is t very very small has never been measured in the way that you would normally measure mass, uh, which is putting it on a bathroom scale, basically. I mean, you, we can't measure the mass, although there are experiments now that are trying to do that. None has yet succeeded. But the way we know they have mass is if they, if they, if the flavors, that, uh, if there weren't different masses associated with different flavors in a, in a complicated way, they couldn't oscillate like that between different flavors. So. That it it and we can actually tell how big the mass differences are, but we um, and it's very very tiny. So uh, it it's a very delicate thing, and uh, it has to do also with with solar physics because when the first neutrinos were measured coming from the sun, they only saw about a third as many of them as as they thought they should see, and and at that time they said, whoa, maybe we don't understand the sun very well. But what it really was, was the neutrinos were oscillating so that when you looked for the flavor that you thought you were going to see, only a third of them had the right flavor. The others had oscillated into the other flavors and were not detected. And, and that, that took decades to figure out. And, um, and a lot of people spending time at the bottom of mines with their big vats of cleaning fluid to, uh, to try to detect these neutrinos. It, it was a, tremendously um, difficult and, and I would almost say heroic effort that was made to, to understand all of this. Is there, I can't remember in your book, is there or was there postulated the concept that there is an anti-neutrino? Oh, yes. Okay. They're, they're definitely anti-neutrino. Well, that's where but, I get, you're already making my brain hurt. <laughs> the flavors make my brain hurt the oscillation makes my brain hurt because it's well, i don't know how you guys did it and i don't know what it actually means but if there's anti-neutrino then does that mean there's an anti-matter neutrino and if there is why is there anti-matter if there shouldn't be any left over just like the anti-electron positron it's more it's even weirder than what you just said so because uh, <laughs> the neutrino we think the anti-neutrino and the neutrino are really just different aspects of the same particle. Unlike the electron and the anti-electron, which we call a positron, which are distinct particles, the neutrino uh, is, and the anti-neutrino are part of the same particle. And it's really that that enables the, the, the matter antimatter to, uh, uh, disappear because the, when the neutrino it, it can change from being a particle to being an antiparticle, and and that's that's uh, if that's 
sort of the the magic trick that enables uh, one of them to uh, more matter to be created than antimatter. Uh, we explain it a little better in the book, I think, than we can do on it, it just on the fly like this. But it's it's um, oh, it, it, it's it's it's, com it's not so much complicated as it is subtle. I would say it's a, a subtle thing that um, um, the, that involves, dare I say it, you know, quantum mechanics and and all the, the weirdness of quantum mechanics comes into play in understanding exactly how this goes on. Well, well and really, to, for you to express frustration in, in this being a challenging thing to understand, I, I mean, one of the reasons we wrote this book is because the neutrino is, in fact, the weirdest, most mysterious particle. I, I, we list uh, uh, the things we know about neutrinos, and it's slightly shorter than the list of things we know that we don't know about neutrinos. So, and a yeah. lot of this is, you know, active, very active science. So we're going to find the solutions, and the answers are going to provide all sorts of really fascinating information. You know, of all people, Donald Rumsfeld said, you know, there's knowns, there's unknowns, and there's unknown unknowns. And it's like Feynman talking about, we learn about, the aliens learn about how we play chess, and we think we have it figured out completely, and then all of a sudden someone castles. You know, <laughs> unknown, unknown. Where did that come from? Yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah it was Feynman, my hero. <laughs> And he's in, he's in he's in that picture too. The the oh yeah, there's some really good pictures and diagrams. Yeah, yeah. The picture of the conference. There's Feynman, of course, and he's the one that's pointed out, and he's there with his long hair, and he's looks and he's in the front row. Yeah, he he is. yeah I, I mean, uh, but but in a way, that's what all physicists live for is when you something like the castle, you know, su suddenly some whole new phenomenon is discovered that you never thought was going to be there and what is that and how do we understand it and what does it imply for the rest of what we know and it it's uh those kind of things don't come along every day but when they do uh, that's really what what gets it physicists excited about their subject yeah it's like you know politicians and the professions don't ever want to admit they're wrong, but you guys love finding out you're wrong. No, I, I like finding out the other guys are wrong, but that's <laughs> yeah. But you know, it's like Elon Musk. The reason why his starships fail is he likes to fail. He likes to fail in action so he learns quicker. And right. it's true. And it's true. Yeah. But uh, well, let's go. <laughs> I've really gone off. Okay, let's go. You know, you were talking about the cleaning fluid. So that's another thing people don't understand. And plus the money. I mean, talk about the one that's under, is it under Antarctica or? Yeah, it's under Antarctica, right? The yeah, giant. That's right. Yeah, ice cube, right? Yeah, 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 right. So explain how that works, because that's really fascinating. And also the idea that you can find this, no one can understand. No no layperson can understand how you can find something so small and what it, you're not finding it, you're finding a measure of it or a, a ghost of it. A trace of it, yeah. Yeah, trace of it. Jane, you want to talk about ice cube? Uh, sure. I, I mean, one of the things is, you know, you talk about uh, it's they're difficult to detect. And we mentioned in the book that in your entire lifetime, uh, one or two neutrinos are going to stop someone in your, in your body. If you had a detector, if you had a, 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 a a photo detector in, embedded in your body, that might lead to a signal you could see. You could be a neutrino detector, but the amount of times that that happens is, is very small. So the, the size of Ice Cube is about twice as large as the combined mass of all the humans on the planet. And that means that you have many, many interactions. And because it's in ice, you can see the, the light that happens because the neutrinos come in and, and there are a couple of ways they can interact, but one of them is that they'll uh, say a, a muon neutrino will will interact with an atom and cause a lot of uh, very high energy uh, particles to be produced. Those particles travel briefly faster than the speed of light in ice. They can't break the speed of light in vacuum, but they can go faster than the speed of light is allowed to in ice. And when it does that, it causes these, these shock waves of light. And we can look at those shock waves of light and see where the neutrino came from. And this is crucial that 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 it be large because of the fact that they're so hard to detect. 
Well, so it's basically go ahead. I mean, it's just basically a huge volume of Antarctic ice that, that they've penetrated with these detectors that they they had to drill um, using hot water and and they drill these holes and insert the detectors and there's a whole array of detectors buried in the ice and when uh, the re reaction that James described takes place then a flash of light is detected by the various detectors and they can tell from that where it came from what and which way it was going and um, and that that's basically how it works and it's right at the south pole that's so cool yeah they're building similar ones in the mediterranean ocean so you, water works almost as well so they're, they're they're having strings floating up from the bottom instead of sunk down into the ice it was amazing the thing about when you see that's the other thing that hooks people is like in the beginning of the book and if you take some if you drill down if you go down the rabbit hole and look at all this research that i looked at you go well maybe it seems like they're saying it's faster than light. And you seemed like you were saying it's faster than light, but it's not faster than light. So explain that because you just said well, it, 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 it might be. This is this is more Alan than me. Uh, okay. There's a there's a possibility. <laughs> there, there, there is a, uh, uh, a, a heterodox view that maybe um, neutrinos or at least some of the flavors of neutrinos might actually be able to travel faster than light because um, I don't want to get into that too much, but um, we don't. don't we, we've not. We have not measured the mass of the neutrino, as I said before. And if the mass turn, if the square of the mass turns out to be negative, that means the neutrino is going faster than light, a little bit faster than light. Um, what all we know right now is that neutrinos travel essentially at the same speed of light. They're so light, their mass is so small that the difference in time travel between them and ordinary light is ne has never been measured. So it's uh, so we don't know if they go slightly slower, which everybody would believe, or slightly faster, which would be it would be if they went slightly faster, it would be one of these revolutionary things that we were just talking about, where you know the castling of, uh, in the chess game, where how did that happen, and then it would create a whole new uh, set of problems that people would have to solve. And, you know, this almost did happen about 10 years ago when uh, an experiment in, in Europe uh, claimed to have measured the speed of neutrinos and that they went actually faster than light. And uh, it was, it, they, neutrinos, since they don't interact, if you have a beam of neutrinos in one place, you can send it to another place hundreds of miles away just by shooting it through the rock and the earth and whatever and put your detector at the other end. And so you can create a big baseline and measure how fast it takes, how long it takes for the neutrino to go from one place to the other place. And they thought they had done it very accurately and they thought that it was faster than the speed of light. And uh, this created a whole, there was about a six month period when physicists went wild trying to explain wh uh, what was going on. And then they found a, a mistake in the experiment and said uh sorry guys it was uh the, yeah. we were only kidding you're only kidding so so that went away but it didn't that didn't mean that uh neutrinos still might travel faster than light but it uh, if you're a betting person don't put your money on it i, I would say <laughs> but, but it's it's a possibility that that and it would be a, a very uh, earth-shattering possibility if, if it actually turned out to be true but we don't know yet well james to further irritate einstein with alan just would have done are are neutrinos capable of becoming entangled in the way of a spooky action at a distance thing well i i actually i think this is probably more an alan question but yeah all all things can become entangled that's it i can't I'm just not smart enough. That's all. I, I I admit it. I'm just not smart enough to even envision something like that. But well, if know, anyone can understand quantum mechanics at that sort of level, I'd, I'd love to. If talk you about said that. that, if you understand quantum mechanics, you're dumb or something like that. Well, wasn't it wasn't it Feynman who said nobody understands quantum mechanics, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, anybody who thinks they understand it is is basically just kidding themselves. But I mean, you can understand entanglement as a as a phenomenon. 
without necessarily understanding quantum mechanics in the sense that Feynman was was talking about. Um, well, it's like you saying the square root, if the square root of a positive mass is negative, you know, I'm, I can't. Yeah. But I do figure out the concept of information somehow being available to me here, even though the information is actually causing a change trillions of light years away. I can kind of get hold of that, but it's hard. You guys got to realize how hard it is. <laughs> well, it, <laughs> uh, yeah, it, it's hard. It, it's also, uh, you know, I mean, the way in which we're maybe kidding people is that we don't present the mathematics that it underlies every, all of this stuff. I mean, because oh, yeah. you can you can talk about it, you can write a book about it, and and be very careful to make sure the book is says the right things and it's not. I mean, give, it gives only correct information, but you're still not. I mean, to to really get to the bottom of it, you really need to see the equations and the uh, and and that requires you know like well go to college and be a physics major or something and take a course in quantum mechanics well but no that's, one buy your book. That's, i mean there's some <laughs> i think uh um sean carroll who's a friend of ours and a science writer i mean a physicist and science writer has just started writing a series of books in which he he actually does put in the equations uh for the public and he thinks he can get away with that but the the the, um, st the conventional wisdom is that that's not you know you cannot put equations in books uh, that people will actually buy <laughs> so I don't know and that's what James does I mean that's what you do and, and but you know and I know you've written about like the Higgs boson which is another weird name because it's the God particle and no one knows what that means but at the time it was the God particle and now they're accelerating at certain fat you know more and finding more things but if the Higgs boson was the God particle and it's basically a field, how does the neutrino fit in with the Higgs boson? Well, I, I mean, the nice thing is it doesn't involve, it doesn't interact with the Higgs boson at all. A nice thing. I, I mean, the thing is that uh, it, I, I used to be a, a Catholic and in a way to me, this is like, it's like the, the, the mystery, right? It's the, it's two different uh, gods sort of, the neutrino is uh, more like the Holy Ghost, I guess. It's a ghost particle as opposed to being the God particle. I don't have a third one, though. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's always the way I thought about the Trinity, you know, the Father, the Son, and then they go, the Holy Ghost. What the heck is that? And like, neutrinos. They're neutrinos. <laughs> Simple. Well, so like, okay, what you're conveying to us is information. That's And that's the currency of the universe. So, and this is another question I asked, but it wouldn't make any difference if it was true. What if this is a solipsistic universe? And only if one of the three of us, the Trinity, only one of the three of us exists. I mean, or another way of putting it is because you found a particle that's so tiny and so irrelevant in our daily lives, but very important as far as the universe is concerned, why can't you posit the fact that say after our death there's a particle inside our brain mind cartesian duality there's a particle that passes beyond that and joins some greater force you can't disprove that can you you can't i think uh, you've exceeded, exceeded my, my expertise well, I mean, on that one <laughs> okay when our wetware dies why isn't there the possibility? Because there's so many things going, like Feynman sitting in the chair and he goes, there's all this stuff passing through me. Why can't there be something that deals with our awareness of our own existence? I told you I'd go way off track. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, I mean, talk about going off track. I mean, it, so, you know, this is, you're talking about information. Well, you, right? brought up, so you, brought up, you brought up Catholicism. So right. it's only that's true. true. That's true. But well, I guess my point is that, you know, there are these issues with black holes and stuff. Information doesn't, doesn't go away. If it, if it does, it's a real problem. So, you know, I don't know about souls or, or, or some sort of uh, thing inside of you that lives on, but the information that is you doesn't go away. And right now we know that black holes can, just recently they've talked about how light can get entrapped around a black hole in a way black holes can record everything that's ever happened in the universe can we ever read it 
probably not. But the information is there. You're not going to go away. Your information is not going to go away. It's, it's saved in, in places like the, the immediately outside of a black hole. It's the best anyone's ever explained it to me. <laughs> I, I don't know if I got it right. <laughs> well, no, you can't know if you got it right because you're inside here. If you could get outside of this, then you could tell me whether you're right or not, but you wouldn't be able to tell me because you're outside of it. What do you think, Alan? <laughs> well, I, 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 I was going to, um, the, uh, you know, the, the Nobel laureate named Roger Penrose, who wrote a big book about quantum consciousness and things like that. So it's possible that, um, I mean, my initial reaction is that when you ask those questions, you're going way beyond um, the realm of physics. Okay, so it's it's it. I, but then there are people like Penrose who deal with um, uh, who try to deal with the same kind of questions of you know what is our. I mean, it's maybe not exactly the same question, but trying to understand consciousness as a quantum phenomenon, and. Um, and invoking quantum mechanics as sort of the the substrate that en enables the, our consciousness to exist. Um, it's cool, but I but you know I I don't have a whole lot to say about any of those issues because it's um, I mean it, they're interesting, fascinating questions, but it's uh, it's not I haven't it's not my area of expertise. I don't know. I, I don't want to. Yeah, I could go on, but it wouldn't. It wouldn't really mean it much. Yeah, and you guys know it can't be experimentally verified. So for you guys, leave it alone. But if you look at like, well, the only book by Penrose that I actually kind of understood was the Periodic Tiling of the Plane, and that was a close one too. But if you read Douglas Hofstetter's "I Am a Strange Loop," he kind of implies that the information because he wants his wife to be still alive, but he kind of implies that she's still here simply because of what you were saying, James, is that the information that she obtained is still available to him. Okay, shall we go back? Oh, okay, you guys have to be sick of talking to me. So in conclusion, um, the last line of your book basically says, hey, there's lots more stuff that's gonna happen. We just don't know what it is. So that's how we should end this. Why do you <laughs> Why'd you say that? Are you covering your asses or is like, what is it? What's that? You know, what is the surprise? We don't know. I mean, for example, there's this huge experiment that's under construction in South Dakota that is, uh, you know, when it comes online a few years from now, it, it will, uh, you know, vastly increase the amount of information we have about neutrinos and, and uh, whether there are more species of neutrinos that we don't know about yet and uh it might even these detectors might even have something to say about the dark matter that you asked about earlier so the, the reason we said that was not just to say well okay we don't you know things might happen but things will happen because there's a lot of i mean that's just one it's a very big experiment that's just one there are others in japan there's others in europe that are uh, that are and in china that are coming online. And so the amount of information over the course of, this, I'd say roughly the next decade is gonna be uh, more than we've had so far. And, and, and so, you know, if somebody were to write this, a book about neutrinos 10 years from now, um, my expectation is it would be, look rather different from, uh, from our book because there'd be a lot more information and things that we have not yet dreamt of. Uh, that have been discovered. And, yeah. I, and in that list that we have of the things we know and don't know about neutrinos, the things we don't know is is technically a longer list, but just about everything on there is being addressed. And many of those, we're just about to find out the answer. I, I can't think of a, a more exciting to me area of science than what's going to be going on with neutrinos for the next uh, 10 years. Maybe if we discover life on other planets, we might do that with neutrinos too. Who knows? Yeah. Yeah, you talked about that. Yeah, you talked about that, which is surprising because it's like one of those questions and an, an ineluctable question. Well, okay, for me to close out and say, you know, thanks for everything. The thing about the bookstore again is this is not a book that you close the cover, close the back cover 
and you go, okay, it was a great book. I'm done. It's the kind of book where you close the cover and you go, oh man, these guys are really making me work. And then you can't stop thinking about it. And even though I don't have the knowledge that you do, I'm still thinking from last week. I woke up this morning thinking, knowing I had to do this, but I woke up this morning thinking, thinking some of these questions and I'll be doing that. And the other thing is I will be in conversation with my peers who are also interested in this kind of stuff. What could be better about a book than that? So uh, nice to hear you say that. And I, and I think, you know, your, your introduction where you sort of summarize the, uh, what you, stuff about neutrinos, that was really very, uh, I was almost getting a little worried that we, you leave us with not a whole lot to say. So, uh, <laughs> you, you did a very good job of, uh, of absorbing what was in the book. I think that well, I was, in the introduction, I always try to trap you guys a little bit and ask yeah. stuff, that, you know, but yeah, you get worried about <laughs> But anyway, thank you both so much. It was just a pleasure doing this. And I wish we could talk for days, but, or maybe I should audit one of your courses. But um, yeah, yeah, thank you again, both thank of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was a lot of fun. It was. See you guys.